good to see you again. <laughs> so last week we had Dr. Carrie Burnight, who talked to us about aging brilliantly. Uh, the other thing she to know is she is an advocate for the elderly. Today we have a speaker who is an advocate to the very young. And so I'm very pleased to soon introduce Karen, Karen Schmelz. One thing I just wanted to remind you about, of course, silence your rectangles, please. And then I wanted to thank everybody uh, last week for staying seated uh, for the question and answer period. That'll be happening around 11 o'clock. And last week you provided great continuity. I really appreciate your active participation and also your uh, positive feedback and your comments. I'm taking them to heart, and thank you so much. You'll also be receiving links following the talks uh, so that you could look further into uh, what you just heard. So it has a, a real lasting, meaningful effect. So a little bit about today's talk. Um, you will be meeting a retired deputy district attorney. Sorry, I lost my all right, I'm back. <laughs> Karen Schmelz prosecuted many different types of cases, including juvenile, homicide, gang, and capital crimes. She spent most of her career prosecuting crimes against children. Mrs. Schmelz took 122 felony cases to trial during her career, including 17 homicide and two capital cases. Her conviction rate for 25 years was 100%, excluding a handful of hung juries. Ms. Schmaus is currently an adjunct professor at, of criminal law and procedure at Chafee Community College in Rancho's, Rancho Cucamonga. And one thing to know, the nature of the talk is sensitive. You will be hearing some difficult material uh, because of, of Karen's work. And so I just wanted you to know, uh, uh, so there, you're going to hear an inside perspective. Part of the reason for these talks is to give you unique perspective and to inform and to know the questions to ask and be aware. And so just want to let you know, uh, this is my disclaimer, there is some difficult material, uh, but you're going to get a, a, ins a true inside perspective. Also want to let you know that next week, we will have another career prosecutor uh, who will be Debbie Ploghaus. She is an advocate for animals. And this is all animals from chickens to cows and dogs and cats. So these are the people who advocate for the littlest victims and the four-legged and many-legged. All right, Karen, please welcome Karen Schmaus. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I can't see anything. <laughs> there we go. There you are. Good morning. Thank you for everybody for turning out today on this beautiful day. Now I'm going to find the clicker. Just drop something on the ground. So we practice all this, and I've forgotten everything he told me. <laughs> Let's see. Mm -hmm. There we go. All right, so as Laura told you, this is me, my high school reunion, <laughs> one of the few pictures I like of me. And I was born and raised in lovely Downey, California, down the way. 
and I obtained a bachelor's degree from Cal State Fullerton in communications, go Titans. And I worked four and a half years as a newspaper reporter. Had no intentions of ever becoming a lawyer. You know, that never crossed my mind. Actually, I wanted to be a police officer. And I studied administration of justice when I was at community college at Cerritos College, but I couldn't get over that six foot wall. And I said, well, this isn't gonna work. So then I decided, well, I'll switch my major. Well, I'll keep my major as criminal justice. And I spent one semester at Long Beach State studying criminal law with the goal to become a probation officer. But the year was 1978, and there weren't any jobs. And I had always dabbled in journalism because I liked to write. And I'd been on the high school, uh, the editor of the high school paper, been on the paper at my colleges. So I abruptly switched my major and went to Fullerton and got my degree in communications and became a newspaper reporter. And worked for a couple of papers. My first paper was in Fullerton. Doesn't exist anymore, now I can see you guys. Doesn't exist anymore, it was called the Fullerton News Tribune, if anybody's from Fullerton. And it went belly up when newspapers went belly up. And then I worked for the Associated Press. And after that job ended, I was unemployed. So I started looking for work and a professor that I knew from the Daily Pilot said, hey, the Ontario newspaper is hiring. I said, where the hell's Ontario? <laughs> and so he told me, and I drove to Ontario, and I tested, and I got the job. And they hired me as a general assignment reporter. And I said, I don't know anyone here. They go, oh, well, you have a background in law, and nobody's really doing the courts. You want to do it? And I said, sure. So I became the courthouse reporter and I started covering all the cases that were in the Ontario courts. And one thing led to another, where I made friends with judges, lawyers, defense and prosecutors, and actually it was a boyfriend who was a deputy DA who talked me into applying for law school. And I said, but I'll be so old when I get out of law school. And he said, well, how old are you now? And I said, 25. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I know, but back then. And then, then then he said, well, how old will you be in three years if you do go to law school? I said, 28. How old will you be in three years if you don't go to law school? 28. I went to law school. He promptly dumped me. And uh, he moved to Santa Barbara. I got my law degree at the University of Oregon. It rained for three years. I had wet socks. Beautiful place, but too wet for me. I came straight back to California and just ruined my thing here. Okay, end of talk, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so got my law degree in 1984 from the University of Oregon, came back to California, and there I am. I was immediately hired at the San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office. Now, how did I manage that? Very carefully. So as I told you, I was the courthouse reporter and I knew everyone. And so it is what you know, but it's also who you know. So early in my newspaper career, there was a new district attorney and the political reporter guy was gonna do the interview with him. And I said, hey, can I do it? He goes, okay. So I went and I did this massive Sunday piece on the then DA, who loved the Sunday piece. So I was in like Flint and I wrote to him and the assistant DA all through law school. And then when I graduated, I said, I'm done, hire me. And so things were so much different back then. You didn't have 500 people applying for one position like you do nowadays. And so I started as a law clerk at the San Bernardino County DA's office. And because the state bar allows people who have finished law school but are awaiting their bar results to try cases, I'd actually tried seven cases as a certified law student before I got my bar results. Passed it on the first try, thank God. I don't think I could have ever taken that thing again. <laughs> and because I'm just too damn lazy, I never tried to go anywhere else. So for 33 years, I stayed put and did my entire career at San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office. And I finally retired. Now it's been, well, almost two years now that I retired. And my main job now I still teach at Chafee College. 
a couple of classes, one or two classes a semester, criminal law, I've been doing that for 10 years, and I'm a grandma. So my daughter is a single mom and I am her help, and I have a crazy three-year-old granddaughter. Okay, so as Laura mentioned, during the course of my 33-year career, I handled all manner of cases. So you start off in misdemeanors, I went to juvenile for a while, I did four years in gangs, and uh, the various units that we have, I went in, into capital cases, I did two capital cases, which are very draining, they're exhausting. I have one fellow on death row, and I'm sure I'll die before he does. And the other one hung 11 to one for death. Uh, one juror voted to spare his life because his mitigating circumstances was he was learning disabled. And she said, well, my son's learning disabled, so the system failed him. So 11 other jurors said he deserved to die. She said he didn't. We didn't want to retry it. He's got life without parole. So he's in some dark jail cell, never to be seen again. So I did those two capital cases and did some drug cases, but my main emphasis was crimes against children. So I did two tours of duty in crimes against children in the 80s and into the early 90s, and I left when I had my first child. It got awful personal when I had a baby, and so it wasn't really the kind of work that I wanted to do when I had small children. And then my kids grew up, and there was an opening, and I went back. And then I stayed for most of the rest of my career, so an aggregate of 12 years that I spent in crimes against children. And the way our office was set up in the 80s, um, it was all sexual abuse against children. When I went back, we had an actual robust um, family violence unit where we combined domestic violence and crimes against children and physical abuse against children. But my specialty was always children. I did some DV, but it was mostly the abuse, physical and sexual abuse. Laura told you that there's sensitive material. There are no gory pictures. So if anybody's worried that they're gonna see horrible pictures, there isn't any of that in here. But the subject matter is sensitive because of the nature, so that was your disclaimer. I believe it is the most difficult assignment in the office because of the victims. I mean, all cases are difficult. Gang cases had their own problems because in gang cases, nobody wants to play. And we often would arrest our witnesses because they wouldn't come to court voluntarily. And real often, your, your victim today is your defendant tomorrow. So gang cases had their own problem, but they didn't have the factor of the victims. You've got very small children, um, you have children been victimized, and then in the homicides, of course, you have a murdered child. So it's difficult on all members of the criminal justice system and everybody who has to deal with it. Okay, so as I just mentioned, uh, the Crimes Against Children unit, as it stands when I went back into it, and as it still stands today, handles both physical and sexual abuse of children, some involving the death of a child. And like Laura mentioned about my conviction record, um, I, I also, I haven't lost any cases at all in 25 years, but only one Crimes Against Children in 1991. And I still remember all the facts of that case, and he was guilty, but I just couldn't prove it. And I'll tell you a little bit more as I talk about it, how difficult these cases are to prove. It isn't because I'm such an amazing prosecutor, but you have to be careful about what cases you pick for trial. And I'll talk about that too, about how we decide what to try and what not to try. Not all crimes against children cases, and I can talk about it now, not all crimes against children cases can be filed. So just because a police officer brings us a case where Susie says she was molested, it doesn't mean we're going to file it. Because the law doesn't require corroboration of sexual assault, but juries do. And you have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the crime occurred. And you might think, well, that should be easy. You know, you just put the kid up there and have the kid tell. No. You had better have something 
that will augment the child's word because if you only have the child, you have a he said, she said. And so cases that may have happened, it may have happened. And many a time I've had to tell a victim and or her parent and her parent that we're not saying it didn't happen, we're just saying we can't prove it. As one judge uh, he, as he put it, I thought this was really good. There's truth and there's trial truth. So it may have happened, that's the truth, but if we can't prove it, we don't have trial truth. And that's why some cases are not filed. Sexual abuse. These crimes are mostly done in private. And adult rape is very similar. In fact, I would say that adult rape has its own issues and in a way are harder to prove than child because at least ch children cannot consent. But in adult rape cases, what do you think the defense normally is? Consent. <coughs> so proving those sometimes is next to impossible and you think we're an enlightened society? No. No, our juries are seeped in the, the early 19th century when it comes to adult rape. It's a whole different topic, which I won't get into today, but proving adult rape, you basically have to have a videotape before you can get a conviction in adult rape cases. But as far as the children are concerned, you've got very small children who maybe cannot articulate, you have traumatized children, uh, you have family members who may not be on the child's side, believe it or not, I had more than one case where mom was not on the child's side. And she was on the, f normally stepfathers. I did have some fathers, but normally stepfathers, and it's where the mother would be on the side of the perpetrator. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so. <coughs> I still have this stupid cough. And trust me, when uh, mom is not on the child's side, it makes it very, very, very difficult. And you have the whole phenomenon also, children will recant. So children will take it back. They'll say it didn't happen. Why? Because they want the status quo. They want the family unit back. If they told and the family unit is splintered, and then suddenly they find themselves in foster care. They're taken out of the home. The family is split up. So there's a tremendous pressure to recant and say it didn't happen. So we ended up having to put, in a number of cases, child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome experts, where experts from the psychological field would come and explain why children do what they do. Why would a, ch a child retract it? Why would a child not tell? And, and so you have to educate your juries about this. <coughs> okay, so why these cases are difficult. Physical abuse, poses its own challenges. Physical abuse, and we're talking about mainly children who are too young to talk, babies, infants, very small children. When you have multiple caretakers, who done it? You have an eight-week-old baby. Eight-week-old baby has broken ribs. Eight-week-old baby has a skull fracture. Eight-week-old baby has a broken leg. But there's multiple people who care for him or her. You've got mom, you've got dad, you've got grandma, you have auntie, who did it? Baby can't tell you. So if you have multiple caretakers, you're gonna have to somehow figure out who is responsible. Subject matter is difficult. So you think it's hard for you to sit and hear it? Think about a jury having to hear it. Jury selection is very difficult in these cases. In the physical abuse, people don't want to hear about children and babies that have been harmed or killed. It's really hard to hear. In sexual abuse, we would have to go through panel after panel after panel of prospective jurors to select a jury in a child molestation case. Because one of the standard questions would be, have you or anyone close to you ever been the victim of child molestation? and you would be astonished at how many people say yes. 
So how we would handle it is we would tell the prospective jurors, if you don't want to talk about this in the group, let us know on this questionnaire and you can talk to us privately. And a number of people would opt for that because who wants to talk about that in front of a big crowd? Can you imagine being in a crowd like this and talking about it? And so I remember one case in Chino when I was working in Chino and a lady had indicated she wanted to talk in private. And so we let the rest of the jurors go on a break and we took her and it was the defense attorney, me and the judge in a very small little jail cell looking office that the judge had. And we brought her in, court reporter's there doing her court reporter thing. And so the judge says, all right, uh, ma'am, what did you want to tell us? And she was a lady around 40. And she said, I have never told anybody ever before, but I was molested at age 12. And she says, I've never said anything to anyone. And she said it was a relative that had molested her and she needed to let us know and she didn't think she could sit on this case and she was tearing up and we're all kind of looking at each other and we're all like, you know, all, all of us, the defense attorney included, were just feeling so bad for this lady. And here she was in her 40s, she'd been molested as a child, she had never told a soul. So the judge was a very kind person. He said, well, maybe, you know, you can go speak to someone about it when you leave. And she says, I think I will. And so, of course, we excused her from service on the jury. But we got that a lot. We got that a lot that people were molested, someone in their family, someone close to them was molested. And it, it, it just happened so much. But the reporting of it is much less. And you would think in this day and age, and this is another thing I, I would have to disabuse juries of when I was trying these cases, is how we've tried to teach our children good touch, bad touch, and stranger danger, and you should always tell. That's a, that doesn't work. Because who do you think mainly are their molesters? You think it's the stranger in the bush? No. It's not the stranger in the bush. Sadly, the molester is going to be a trusted person. It is going to be their parent, their grandparent, their step-parent, their uncle, their aunt, their youth leader. The very people they would go to. So kids, and they don't tell, kids also, they think it's their fault. They think they've done something wrong. They think they're going to be punished. So the number of kids who tell versus the number of kids who don't tell, they don't tell. But again, you bring in the juries, once you finally get rid of the 4,000 people that have been molested or have had somebody close to them, then you've got to get all the people that have preconceived notions. The kids tell. Well, my kid would tell. Well, my kid would tell me if somebody touched him wrong. No, your kid probably wouldn't. So we had to deal with that. And then when you have all the myriad other problems in trying these cases, which I'll go into about the proof problems. I'm okay, I already said that. <laughs> Victims are sometimes too young to testify. The, there's no minimum age in California where a child is qualified or a person is qualified to testify. It's not like there's a magic age. But the child must be able to articulate that she knows the difference between right and wrong. So that, that she can take the oath and she can testify truthfully. The youngest child I ever qualified was four. It was a very bright four-year-old. And she was able, she was a child, sexual abuse victim, and she was able to say, she was able to articulate what a lie was and that she would get punished. So you would have to show that the child knows what a lie is and that the consequence is punishment. So you would normally ask her, if mommy told you to clean up your room and you, did, and, you, and you didn't do it, but you said you did, is that true or a lie? And she goes, I always clean up my room. I go, okay, but let's say you didn't. And mommy says, Jane Doe, did you clean up your room? And you go, yes, mommy, but your room is this big sloppy mess. Would that be true or a lie? And she goes, oh, that'd be a lie. And then the follow-up question would be, would you get in trouble? She goes, no, because I always clean up my room. 
I mean, this is what you get with kids. So you have to be very patient. They're very literal. I said, but if you had lied, would you get in trouble? She goes, probably. I'd probably get a timeout. So that was enough to get over the threshold that she understood what a lie was. It's a concept, and so children, they're concrete, they're not conceptual, so you have to learn a whole different language when you deal with children and how to talk on their level. And so we all have kind of like our standard qualifications of kids, um, maybe not even that sophisticated if you don't have that bright of a kid. You would hold up like a, a pen, say, um, Jimmy, I'm holding the pen up. What color is my pen? And Jimmy goes, red. Jimmy, if I told you this pen was green, would that be true or a lie? Well, it'd be a lie, because it's red. So that's how you, you, would, you would start maybe that basic. And, but then you've got to get into, well, what happens when you lie? But you can imagine if they're younger than four or they're not a smart four-year-old, they may be too young to testify. And there's a lot of rules about the evidence code about when hearsay is admissible and when hearsay isn't. But if you don't have the victim and you don't have any other extrinsic evidence, I did have a five-year-old girl who probably would have been competent to testify, but she had physical signs of being molested. And the perpetrator had videotaped it with his iPhone. Yes. He is doing 50 years in a dark hole for taking his iPhone and videotaping himself having sex with a five-year-old. Yes, disgusting. And she was a little girl that was, uh, the, mo the mom was like a kind of a casual friend of his. Mom was usually on meth, so she would leave kid with whoever, including this guy. And so he began grooming the little girl and uh, had full-on sex with her. It was just unbelievable. And Mom, mom was the one who actually reported it. Meth mom was good enough to report it because what happened is the little girl got sick. She calls her friend, the defendant Gomez, says, I need a ride to the hospital. He comes over and he accidentally leaves his phone at her house. And so when she comes back, she sees his phone. She picks it up and the screensaver's her kid. She says, why is my kid his screensaver? So dummy didn't have his phone locked. She went through his phone. She found the vids. So she immediately took it to the police station. So the cops go and arrest him. He doesn't know that his phone's missing or that his phone's been turned in. He gives the most convincing hour-long interview denying he ever did anything. And so if you ever think that, well, defendants, you know, they're not going to lie. Oh, yes, he was. And he said, was very convincing. I love her like my own child. I would never do a thing to her. And then they finally reveal, we have your videos. He goes, oh, it was her idea. Oh, okay. And then the, office, the detective said, would you like to write out a letter? And he goes, sure. And he writes, dear victim, we can't do stuff anymore because, you know, of what you did. And because of what you did. And he blamed it all on the five-year-old. It was just repulsive. So the public defender, who was one of the most, you know, we call them true believer public defenders that would believe in it, she was so happy to plead him up. And, and I mean, it was... The proposed sentence was a million years of life. And so the guy was 50-something, late 50s. And so we took 50 years. He'll never see daylight, hopefully. So that was, that was, I could have proven that one. I'm glad the little girl didn't have to testify. Meth mom, by the way, we ended up having to prosecute her for child endangering because even after this, she left her kid with yet another virtual stranger and they found the kid wandering among nails and dirt in her nightgown, and meth mom went off to meth rehab. All right, my longest sex crime sentence. So you might be thinking, well, how long are these sex crime sentences? Okay, it was 300 years to life for pimping a 13-year-old girl. And so this case was interesting because the defendant, whose name was Reginald Christopher, Look at my time. Reginald Christopher was a gentleman who at age 17 and a half was convicted of raping a young woman on a college campus in Los Angeles. She was getting out of her car to take her exams when he attacked her at gunpoint. And he raped her and then dumped her off in some neighborhood. 
and she turned out to be a very good victim, had remembered enough identifying factors about him that he was caught. He was prosecuted as an adult and sent to prison for 25 years. And he emerged after that in his 40s or something. And he went to Pomona, where his family was from, where his father owned a um, barber shop. And so his father was going to enroll him in barber school and give him a job at the barber shop. But Reginald decided that he would much rather be a pimp because he had heard in prison, you know, that pimps make a lot of money. So he goes out and becomes a stereotypical pimp where he gets himself a Cadillac and he gets himself purple shoes. And yes, he is a black gentleman. So he looks like Shaft. And he goes, well, now I need to go find myself prostitutes. So Pomona Montclair has this area called Holt Boulevard that they call the track. And that's where the prostitutes are. Well, meanwhile, 13-year-old Anita had run away from home for the nth time. And she's wandering around and meets this fellow. And he says, do you want to start working for me? And she's looking for money, and sadly, her mother was a prostitute. So it was not unknown to her, and she said, sure. So she started working for him. Well, kind of, because a lot of times she'd tell him she was working, but she'd be in the coffee shop. And she just gave him enough money just so that he thought she was working. But she was meeting men that he would arrange. And also, he had a GPS monitor on his ankle because he was a sex offender. So he couldn't live anywhere near schools or churches or anything, so he lived in his car at a Riverside Park and Ride. And he would have sex with the victim in his car at the Riverside Park and Ride with his ankle monitor on. So everything went along where they made a little bit of money, and this went on for about two weeks when he decides that he needs another girl in his stable. So he tells Anita, you need to recruit someone. And so they see this young woman kind of wandering around the track. And so he says, that one over there, and I'll wait over here. So she goes over to the young woman and says, hey, my daddy wants to know if you want to come work with us, and we make a lot of money, and we make like a 1000 a week, and he's over there, you want to work with us? And so she goes, OK. And so as they approach, and then the woman says, you're under arrest, Montclair Police Department. <laughs> she was an undercover cop. And so he sees something's up, he splits, but she radios out his description. He gets caught a couple blocks over by the other officers, and then he claims that he's just her uncle dropping her off. And then later he says, no, she told me she's 19. She was 13, her nickname was Babyface13. That was on her phone, she looked 13. And the law says that if you molest somebody under the age of 14, we don't care what they told you, and we don't care how old they look, so it's, it's like strict liability. So that defense didn't work. But the funniest part about this case really was that Anita told me later, she said, I knew that wasn't a real prostitute. You know, the undercover cop, I said, how'd you know? And she goes, her shoes were wrong. <laughs> because the undercover cop had like sandals on or something, you know, the flat sandals, and, and she didn't have like the high heels. So another postscript about this case is my juvenile was a habitual runaway. And I wanted to get this case into court when she was in custody at Juvenile Hall because that was the only way I could ensure that I was going to actually have her. Every time they put her in placement, she would run away. And so I actually just bulldozed my way. I went from courtroom to courtroom. I didn't care who I pissed off. I went to the presiding judge and I said, I need a courtroom. He goes, well, we have all these other cases. I said, I need a courtroom and I need it now. And by the way, I have statutory priority that you guys never give me because the judges are worried about, well, my last day case, my time is running. I said, no, I need a courtroom, and I'm going to go to every single courtroom, courtroom in this county until I get one. So finally, shut me up. He gave me one. And we had a small window of opportunity where Anita was still locked up. And she was, only about, she was 14 when we finally tried the case. She did testify truthfully. A year later, when she testified as a witness in a murder case, she lied. And I said to her, hey, Anita, you lied. And she goes, you do what you got to do. It was a gang murder case. And so she'd become hardened, sadly. But the point of this story is we have criminal justice reforms. And one of the criminal justice reforms that came a few years ago was in human trafficking. We're going to treat our, vi our 
juvenile prostitutes and our young women as victims, not suspects, and that sounds good, right? Because they are victimized. Certainly she's 13, and she's been victimized by this guy, but here's the practical problem. If Anita's not locked up, she's not coming to court. So nowadays, I probably would not have been able to put this guy for 330 years of life because she wouldn't have shown up to court. And sure, you can issue a warrant for their arrest, and, or you can issue a bench warrant, but then they're going to let them out. So there's the difficulty if your victim isn't going to cooperate and you don't get a lot of cooperation. So why did he get such a massively long sentence? Because he was a three-striker and because he was a prior sexual offender, and so the aggregate for all the sentencing, so he got this monstrously long sentence, and this is from the uh, California Department of Corrections. He's 56 years old now. He went in in 2011. His parole date should be in 2341, right, if you do the math? No, we have another reform. So the legislature says, hey, these guys are getting old, and their criminality probably isn't as much when they're old. Like, can you guys imagine running over and knocking down a, you know, a 7-Eleven at your age? You wouldn't get far, right? <laughs> so the legislature says that they're getting old. Also, they're charging us a lot of money, you know, because they all have health problems. So you have the elderly inmate parole rule. So he is going to be eligible in four years for an earlier parole hearing in October of 2033. Now, that doesn't mean he'll get out. It'll all depend on his behavior, his history at the state prison. But the elderly and the very young, they don't necessarily stay as long as they should. But that's Reggie, so he still has spent most of his life in state prison. And I don't feel sorry for him because he could have had a job as a barber and he chose to be a pimp. Okay, so I'm going to start with, a, I have three cases to talk to you about that were cases in my career, and again, there's no bloody pictures, but there is some sensitive subject matter. So the first one is a child murder, the Lucero case. And there was a good outcome. He was convicted and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison for killing his girlfriend's two-year-old son. <laughs> and I won't be reading this to you, but this is the part of the article. 25 years to life, and it was in 2013 where the killing happened. So here are the participants. On the defense side, this is the defendant, Michael Lucero, 21 years at the time. And this is the super lawyer, Lenny Levine. Now, I like Lenny. We got along great. We were very friendly with each other, but he bills himself as a super lawyer, you know, with this massive conviction rate or um, acquittal rate. And my very, I know, he, this guy thought that he was going to get off. And then this is his father, this guy's father, Michael Lucero Sr., who sat second chair during our trial, which was extremely weird. No one had ever heard of it. And so he was like assisting the, attor the main attorney in the murder case of his own son. And actually, the jury didn't like it. He didn't do much. He just mainly sat there and glared at me. Okay, so this is a little bit little Leonard Levine. See, he says, look, I win 90% of all my cases. You know, he's kind of like the attorney to the stars. His latest is George Tyndall, the USC gynecologist, accused of molesting all the girls. But like I said, Lenny and I are buds. But you see, just because you're a super lawyer doesn't mean you're going to get everybody off. So this is Xavier, two and a half when he was killed. Xavier and his mom, Olivia. So this is a little a news clip. We'll give you some insight about the case and then I'll fill it in. So if you could do that for me. Thank you.
NBC4's Tony Shin live in Rancho Cucamonga now with what surprised the victim's family in court today. Tony. Carolyn, I can tell you that family members of the victim are relieved that the killer got the maximum sentence of 25 years to life. They were hoping for justice, and today they got it. He's a wonderful baby, a great spirit, a wonderful spirit. It's almost been three years since Olivia Takati's son, Xavier, was murdered, but the pain in her heart is just as deep today as it was the day he died. I just can't believe he's gone. In April 2013, Xavier lost consciousness at Olivia's Ontario apartment. She was at work and her boyfriend, Michael Lucero, a former Marine, was watching the two and a half year old boy. Doctors tried desperately to keep Xavier alive, but sadly he didn't make it. The medical examiner later ruled his death a homicide, saying Xavier had a skull fracture and internal injuries consistent with child abuse. He was beat. He didn't look the same. When I saw him, though, that's not how my son looked when I left. for the last time I saw him. Olivia says Michael was angry that Xavier was sick and he didn't want to take care of him. And that's what led to the beating. Michael claimed he was innocent, but a San Bernardino County jury disagreed. He sentenced to 25 years to life. Today in court, a judge gave Michael Lucero the maximum sentence for killing Xavier. Family members, including Xavier's grandmother, read victim impact statements and were surprised by Michael's lack of emotion. To be so cold and so callous, like there's not a care in the world, it's so difficult because every moment's been so painful for us. And it's a pain that'll never go away for Xavier's family, especially for Olivia, who would do anything just to see her son one more time. There's not a day I don't, that doesn't go by that I don't think of him or wish I could hold him again. Michael Lucero's family was also in that courtroom today. In fact, his sister also made a statement saying they stand by the 22-year-old man. Reporting live in Rancho Cucamonga, I'm Tony Shin, NBC4 News. Developing now. Okay, so we'll get back to that same slide. All right. So briefly, the facts of this case. Olivia, who you saw in the clip, was a young mother of Xavier, and she met Michael. Michael was actually Marine Corps Reserve, so wasn't really a real former Marine. And so he, Olivia was a stripper at an adult club, and that's where Michael met her. And so I had to overcome in my address to the jury, and in fact, from the very beginning, when I picked the jury, any stigma against Olivia that she worked as a stripper. So I am always a believer in I deal with my issues head on. And I told the jury from the very get-go that the mother of this child worked as a stripper. Is that fact alone going to cause you not to be a fair juror? And we, we went through that about the choice of work that she had. And so Michael, Michael met her at the strip joint at the place where she worked as a stripper, Deja Vu. And they began dating. And she, she thought, you know, he was an upstanding young man, came from a good family, father was a lawyer. And he immediately just started sponging off of her. And the only work that Michael was doing was his weekend warrior once a month, you know, going and being his reserve marine thing. And kind of sort of started looking for work, but not really hard. And so he had agreed to take care of Xavier, her little boy, while she worked. And she worked nights, because that's when strippers work. And so he would stay home with the boy, and he would drive her back and forth to work, and she worked all the way in the city of industry, and they lived in Ontario. And so she'd be home mostly during the day, but then she'd be working, you know, usually about... Well, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, she'd go to work. And he became very controlling. This case was both about domestic violence and child abuse. And he, he became very much an abuser of her, um, mental abuse, physical abuse, and tried to control what she did. He was happy to have her work and bring the money home, 
but he didn't want her to have any sexual relations with any of the people that she worked with. Now, of course, it was forbidden. You know, in the world of strip, it's supposed to be lap dances. I don't know how much you know about strippers. We all learned very much about strippers during this course of this trial. But her main work was lap dancing, where they would simulate the sexual activity. But you could also pay for a private session, and things might go a little further, you know, depending on the stripper. And so he was hugely jealous that if she did any privates, that he was sure she was doing sexual things, which she said she wasn't. And so he didn't want her working after one in the morning. Well, that's where she made the good money. So they fought over her working after one in the morning. And he would text her incessantly, wanting to know, where are you? What are you doing? How many clients are you doing? What are you doing with your clients? And, and just pestering her. And, and so what led to the death of this poor child was he was getting more jealous and more jealous. She was stubbornly saying, I'm not going to stop working after one. That's where I make enough money that I can pay our rent. And so he was getting really angry about that, and he started taking that out on the boy. When the child was finally taken to the hospital, he had a lacerated pancreas because he had been kicked so many times in the stomach. Now, the other thing I had to overcome with the jury was not only that Olivia was a stripper, but that Olivia was not seeing or doing anything about the beating of her son. So he was kicking him in the stomach, he was hitting him, and Olivia noticed bruises on Xavier, and there were some bruises on his face. And she said, she was at work when it happened, she says, Michael, what happened? He fell. Your kid's clumsy. You know, your, your stupid kid fell down the stairs. And Olivia wasn't the brightest also. <laughs> so she's kind of going, well, okay. And she never thought Michael would hurt him. And so Michael went as far as telling her, you better put makeup on his bruises because if anyone sees it, they're going to report you to CPS and they always blame the mom. So they were taking him to a friend to watch him while they were going to Knott's Berry Farm and she put makeup on his bruises. And so, of course, that was used extensively by the defense that she's a bad mom. And so I had to overcome she was not doing anything about what should have been obvious. But she felt this, you know, she was the only one paying the rent, and he wasn't. So on the night in question, he, his jealousy went into overdrive. And he was just texting her like crazy, I know what you're doing, how come you haven't texted me back, it's been five minutes. I know what you're doing. Your kid, he's barfing all over the place. He's puking all over the place. I have to clean it up. He was puking all over the place because his pancreas was lacerated. And so he got madder and madder that he was cleaning up after the child and because he thought she was doing things that he didn't want her to do. And we don't know to this day what exactly he did, but he crushed that little boy's skull. We, we don't know if he used an instrument. We don't know if he slammed him against anything. So when the boy goes unresponsive, he finally calls 911. There's like seven minutes or something where he calls 911. He says, he stopped breathing. I don't know what to do. And so they, try to, they say, are you doing CPR? He says, yes, but he really wasn't. And then he calls Olivia and says, you've got to come home. Your kid's sick or something wrong with your kid. And the ambulance comes and takes Xavier away, and she goes and picks him up, or she gets a ride or something. She's still at the hospital. She tells the detectives he wouldn't harm him. He loves him, just as his own. So she didn't blame him. And it wasn't until later when she found out the horrible facts that she realized what had happened. At trial, they tried to paint her as the worst mom that ever lived. She's a dirty, rotten stripper. She's probably having sex with her clients, which... If she was or wasn't, how does that change anything with the murder of her son? And that they brought in a $10,000 expert that claimed that Xavier died from the pancreatitis, not from the massive skull hematoma, and uh, tried to blame that on Olivia because she was around him while he was beginning to get the pancreatic thing. Our medical examiner, who was the chief medical examiner for County San Bernardino, was my witness. He said, yes, the pancreatic injury would have killed him eventually. 
if not treated, but that's not what did kill him. The traumatic head injury killed him within hours, and that happened that night. And fortunately, the jury believed the chief medical examiner, and that was the key evidence. So key evidence number one was the chief medical examiner. Key evidence number two, I convicted Michael with his own cell phone messages. Text messages are gold. Now, Michael wasn't cooperative. He refused to give us the password to his phone. We got a court order for him to do it. He told us to, you know, what are you going to do? And subsequently, the law has said that they can't be forced to do it. So we never got the password. We tried to break in his phone. We couldn't. But Olivia had all the messages. Olivia's phone had this much. And the whole pattern of domestic violence showed. And all those messages that night where he was enraged and accusing her of cheating on him with her clients and about how he hated this kid and this kid. And so the jury came to the right decision. And so that is how I proved the case against Michael Lucero. So there he is, He's serving 25 years to life at Avenal State Prison. He is a youthful offender. So he will be eligible for parole in 2034. Happily, at least currently, our parole boards are loath to let murderers of children out on their first try. And Michael, he's a real jerk, so I don't think he's probably doing well in prison. So all that will count. I will probably go to his parole hearing. I'll only be in my 70s. I'll go. <laughs> you know, I'll go to all the parole hearings for my people and just, you know, come into my cane. And <laughs> He's a bad person. This is the sweetest thing I ever got from a victim's family. This urn is only about so big at a victim's rights uh, memorial service about two years after Xavier's death. Mom and Grandma gave me the little urn containing some of Xavier's remains. And it gives me goosebumps still. It's on my mantle. I mean, it's the most sweetest thing. They said, you gave us our lives back. You put his murderer away. And that's why I would do those 12 and 14 hour days. You know, give up my life to prosecute these because for the families. I can't do anything for Xavier, but I could for his mom and I could for his grandma. So, thank you. And they're still my Facebook friends. Okay, so quickly, child murder number two is the Garcia case. A little different. I mean, similar but different. And this, so skip this. This is Ryan Garcia. And you see these parallels, young men. Ryan was a little different because Ryan was the babysitter for seven-month-old Lucas. And he wasn't just some random guy that, again, you know, they try to blame the mom. There's a pattern here, let's blame the mom. And he was a good friend, he and his girlfriend were a good friend of the mom's. They had been roommates before the mom got pregnant with Lucas, so she trusted them. It all comes with trust. And so he wasn't working, he's kind of, he's living in a pool house in the backyard of his mom's house. And they had two kids of their own, so Heather, single mom, goes back to work and he and his girlfriend agree to watch her little boy for 25 bucks a week. Such a deal, right? And she trusted them and they had their own two kids. So he was charged with murder and assault on a child becoming comatose. And here's the last picture alive of Lucas and his mom put on Facebook, I never thought this would be the last picture I took of him. I never thought it would be the last night he ever slept in his crib. And what happened is Heather had been off for a while. She went back to work on her third day at work. And she dropped Lucas off and with his bottle. And Ryan was still in bed. And so his girlfriend, Alicia, said, you get up and take care of him. I got to take care of our daughters. And he goes, rah, rah. and Lucas was kind of fussy. And so he took Lucas into the other room with the bottle, and Lucas was apparently not cooperative. And so he started shaking Lucas, and Lucas started crying more, and he started banging Lucas's head against a hard object, which we figured out was probably the hard part of the couch, and took his frustrations out on a seven-month-old baby, and lo and behold, his skull 
was shattered in several places. And then he puts him down and props the bottle up in his mouth and tries to figure out what to do. And then he eventually goes and tells Alicia, hey, something's wrong with the kid. And then they call 911 and the paramedics come and the baby's unresponsive and they take him off to the hospital and he's brain dead. And they go, he came that way. Mom dropped him off like that. And so that was the story that mom brought the comatose baby, which was completely contradicted by a previous statement that Alicia had made that he was cooing and babbling and talking. So I won't go into all the ramifications, but once again, let's blame mom, let's blame someone else. So Luke has finally had justice. This case was very difficult. Um, the biggest mistake that was made in the trial of this case is we took too long. Uh, the judge assigned to it was retiring. He had a use-it-or-lose-it vacation. We had to take a vacation in the middle of the trial. Um, my granddaughter was being born, so I got two weeks off to go to Illinois and watch her get born. Then the defense attorney said, my turn, I want some time off. And then the defense attorney kept adding new expert witnesses that I'd never heard of. It became a big mess. The jury lost the thread of it, and we ended up with a hung jury where the defense was he accidentally oopsie doo dropped him. You know, the story migrated from mom dropped him off comatose, which was bullshit because he would have died instantly, to I oopsie doopsie doopsie dropped him in a short fall, and they had, they had no shortage of experts for a fee would say that, even though our expert child abuse from Loma Linda our expert witness says no way would he have that many in our pathologist. So it hung seven to five for guilty. I got out of the unit, someone else took it over, and about a year and a half later, they were able to plea bargain it to where he did 18 years in state prison. And the victim signed off on it. She didn't want to go through it again, the victim's mom. And she put this on Facebook, it was an amazing day. You know, he, he's gonna be in prison. Justice was served till 2029. And she's getting 49000 in restitution. She said, every time he has to send that money to me, he has to think of my little boy. This is where I just talked about what the actual sentence was. And the actual sentence was uh, 18 years, four months for voluntary manslaughter and child abuse. And his consistent custody. Okay. All right, so is there any happiness or any good that comes out of the death of a child, of course not. However, what did happen in this case, Lucas's mom, even though she's only 21 years old, she was selfless enough to donate Lucas's heart, Lucas's liver, and his kidneys. And his heart went to this little girl. And here is a little clip about Heather meeting the little girl that got her son's heart. All right, imagine hearing your baby's heartbeat two and a half years after he suddenly died. Well, that happened to a California mother, and Ben Tracy shows us how she turned her personal tragedy into new hope for a little girl she never met until now. I... These two mothers had never met until this weekend. But their lives had formed an unbreakable bond two and a half years earlier. Heather Clark lost her seven-month-old son, Lucas, in June of 2013. Lucas was very energetic, very smiley. Losing a child, you lose, you lose yourself. I was like, I don't ever want any mother to go through what I'm about to go through. And that's when I decided to sign the paperwork and save somebody else's child. She decided to donate his organs, including his heart. It went to Esther Gonzalez's daughter, Jordan, now four years old. How are you a present? You got me a present? No way. I got you a present. Another one. Jordan's mother knows that first gift was the gift of her daughter's life. By the time she was 18 months old, she had undergone six surgeries because of a congenital heart defect. A transplant was her only hope. One of my favorites. She would be so selfless to be able to think of another family while she's going through her grief. Living in different states, the two mothers had been in touch only through the mail, social media, and phone calls in the years since the transplant. 
It wasn't until they finally decided to meet in person that Heather Clark was able to do this. Listen to her baby's heart beating inside Jordan's chest. That's your baby. It's so strong. It is. It was magical. It was crazy. It was sad. There's absolutely no word, no explanation for it besides just magic and wonderful. She says the joy of seeing Jordan healthy is helping her deal with the pain of losing her son. Knowing that she's so smart and so respectful and, you know, it just makes it so much easier because she's just exactly what I could picture Lucas being right now. For CBS This Morning, Ben Tracy, Los Angeles. That's, a beautiful That's gift. truly a gift that you can't, that is irreplaceable, but for her to say it's magical and sad really does some. I sure wish I had you in my court. It would have been so nice to have somebody like him. Sadly, Jordan did pass away um, at the age of five, but her family had three years with her that they wouldn't have had. And so her, her, the heart was rejected by her body, but they are eternally grateful for giving her three years of relatively health. And I contacted Heather prior to coming to you today, and I said, have you heard from any of the other donor families? She said that the liver went to a little boy named Tegan, and he's still alive. He's around four or five, and he does have some health issues, but he's still with us, and the kidneys went to a 30-year-old, and she didn't have any further contact. But Heather's now very involved in the One Legacy Donate Life movement, you know, where you, where you donate parts and all that to get people to be organ donors because she said it gave her comfort to know that her little boy lived on. Okay, so now we will segue from baby murder to sex crimes. I told you this was going to be an uplifting morning. <laughs> so part of my job was the physical abuse and a large part of my job was the sexual assault. And when I was putting this PowerPoint together for you, I thought, all my victims in this PowerPoint are boys. And, and I did have several child molestation cases where boys were the victims. And this is one of them, People versus Hernandez. And this is another one of those hefty sentences. And this fellow here, let's see a little bit here. This here, um, Hernandez, Mario Hernandez, he was the boy's great uncle. That was the caretaker of the victim. And so this is a story about the conviction. So what happened here? Okay, before I tell you what happened here, I'll tell you a little bit about the little boy, JJ. So Mario Hernandez was the great uncle of JJ and his brother, Skyler. What happened is JJ and Skyler's parents were both into drugs, and they were three and two years old, and they were found wandering the streets of Upland in only their diapers. And so the Child Protective Services took him into custody, and they were looking for a placement for the boys because the parents were deemed incompetent to take them. And they looked to family first. So is, is there any member of the family who is willing and able to take care of these children? And the great aunt stepped up and said, we'll do it. And the Hernandez was her husband. So he was the great uncle by marriage. And so the great aunt and the great uncle took custody of the boys when JJ was, I guess JJ was three and his brother was four by the time they were placed. And JJ later told us that his earliest memory was three years old when the molestation started. So what were the charges? There were some very, very serious charges against Mario Hernandez. There was sodomy with a child aged 10 or younger, oral copulation with a child 10 or younger, and continuous sexual abuse of a child under the age of 14. This count here was a wonderful reform in the law of sexual abuse that happened somewhere in the 90s because it's very hard to distinguish one act of sexual assault against another when it's continuous, when it happens all the time. How do you differentiate them? So, 
this statute was passed where you could charge them with continuous sexual abuse as long as you could prove three or more incidents during a time period. And if you had three or more, then you got this charge, which is a very serious charge leading to a lot of state prison time. Okay, so in this particular case, how did I prove it? I had two witnesses, and in fact, when I first read this case, when the Upland detective brought it to me, I said, this is an iffy case. Because the defendant says it didn't happen, and I've got a boy saying it happened, and our only corroboration was that his slightly older brother claimed to have witnessed some of it, but we didn't have any other physical type of corroboration. So it was a tough case to prove, and troubled boys taken away from their parents, a lot of built-in defenses. So then you go and you use what you have to try to augment the children's testimony. We were lucky in that we had access to the house where it happened because another family member was living there that was sympathetic to us. Because many times, it's the perpetrators that live in the home. And they're not about to let you near it. And we can't force them. If the police don't take evidence pictures at the time, and they hadn't in this case, which really made me mad, and I told my detective, you know, you could have taken some pictures, but we were able to go in before trial and take some pictures. So the scene of where most of the assaults happened was the defendant's bedroom where he lived with his wife, the great aunt, who, who we did not believe was aware that he did these things. He stayed home, she worked, and he was like infirm or something. And so he would wait till she was gone. The boys slept in this little outside room and the defendant's bed was here. So this is JJ, several years after he reported it. We didn't, the case was reported in 2013. We tried it in 2015, I think, something like that. So he cooperated by showing us the position that he was in when some of the assaults in the bedroom occurred. And then this is where his brother Skyler was looking through the blinds on the other side. So we had Skyler get into the crouch where he was watching. And this was a huge part of the defense. They said, this is a lie. Skyler made it up because the blinds were actually inside the glass. So you couldn't manipulate the blinds. There was a manipulator on the other side. So they said, he lied. He made it up but you could barely see when you look through. And they, they even brought the defendant's youngest daughter in, who was probably about 23 years old, and she was expected to say, you can't see through that. Well, she double-crossed the defense. She said, you can see. There's enough light. And you should have seen the public defender. He's like, ah! And I'm going, yes! You know, the, the moments, you know, where they, their witness augments your case. So older brother peering through blinds. This became important because he corroborated. And the way that J.J. said it would happen is that the defendant would tell J.J., you owe me. You wanted a toy. You wanted cereal. You wanted me to sign your school ledger for school. You owe me. You owe me means you have to have sex with me. And so that's what he would do. And then he would tell uh, J.J. He only molested J.J. He didn't molest Skyler. He, he would physically swat Skyler all the time, but he wasn't molesting him. And so Skyler started figuring out what was happening about what you owe me means. And so once or twice he peered through the blinds and he could see the shadows of what was happening to his brother. He didn't say anything either. They're children. They're, they feel helpless. Okay, and then we also had him show in the shower. Now, why did I do this? The defense is saying... The story is impossible. It couldn't have happened that way. It's physically impossible. So you have to show how is it possible. Without getting into the gory details, we showed it was possible, the position that he had said where it happened. Heights of the various participants and things like that. Okay, so um, I was telling you about this uh, law 
these are the numbers of times that we could differentiate different acts. We would have him talk about what he had been doing that day when the defendant said, you owe me, and when he had to come in so that we could prove. And I told the jury, I only have to prove three times, but look at how many times I proved it. You have way more than you need to find him guilty. So uh, the way that it worked in San Bernardino County, and it works in most counties nowadays, is back in the bad old days, most of you are old enough to remember the McMartin case, right? The McMartin case was a terrible case in Los Angeles County where it was at a preschool, it was a, at a private preschool, and a bunch of very small children told terrible tales of being molested by satanic things and brought down to basements and horrible things happened. And the daycare worker and her son and maybe another worker were charged with all these horrible, horrible counts of child molestation, and it bombed miserably. They were acquitted. The case just went south and sideways. And one of the biggest problems with the case, not only were they very small children, which are very hard to work with, but also the interviewing process was completely flawed, where it was shown that the interviewers of the children were suggesting things. And that's a huge thing you have to get over when you try child molestation cases, is that there was no suggesting to the children what the answer is. So what we do is we have the police interview that is taped, and then we send them to the child assessment center where a trained assessor will ask them open-ended questions. What happened next? Then what happened? All right, where did he touch you? Or, or the child will say, he touched me. You said he touched you. On what part of your body did he touch you? Well, he touched me on my weeha. What is a weeha to you? So it's using the child's language and never suggesting the answer. And then we play those tapes to the jury so they know that no one put it into the children's head. So I'm going to move along because I'm talking too much and I still have another, video, another PowerPoint for you. So there's the, there's the two boys. How did it, how did it end? Okay, so I told you before that we use whatever we can to corroborate our cases. It wasn't the case where JJ went to the authorities and said, my uncle's molesting me. No, it happened at school where he, he was talking to some other kids and something happened in line and some kid was complaining about something at home and JJ blurts out, well, at least you don't have to go home and get molested. And a little girl that was a friend of his in line heard that and asked her mommy, what does molester mean? And we're, I mean, we're talking about 10-year-olds. And so the mom told her and then said, where'd you hear that word? Well, little JJ said it. And the next day, the kids asked JJ if it happened again, and he said, no, not last night. So the little girl told this to mom. Mom thankfully called the principal. And I told her, thank you, you stopped you, by your action, your proactive action, you stopped this little boy from being victimized. Principal called him in and JJ admitted that it had been happening. This was important because the defense was the kid made it up. These are, these are troubled children and the, the public defender blamed Skyler for everything, the older brother that had acted out more. Skyler put it in his head. Skyler got him to say it. Skyler is mad at Hernandez, because Hernandez punished him for something, so it's all made up. But that wasn't the way it came out, and that was an important in a proof. But JJ was just an amazing witness. So guilty of everything, yay! Off he goes into the state prison, but he's elderly, but he still has to serve 25 years, so he isn't going to emerge until he's at least 81. Good place for him. Okay. So you're thinking, how can I help child victims? There are ways. Orange County, where you happen to be, has a program, and it's becoming a child advocate. And so if we could click on this one link, this is on the district attorney's website, and they have what looks to be, I don't have personal knowledge of it because I didn't work here, but they have what looks to be a robust child advocate program where they take volunteers to work with the children to play with the children, to make the children comfortable, and they're happy to have volunteers. So how could you help? You could do it that way. 
and then uh, San Bernardino and Riverside County, we won't go on their links, but they also have victim volunteers. They don't call them child advocates, but they also have volunteers. So that's a way to help. And another way to help, I promised Heather that I would tell you this, become a donor. I was at the DMV two days ago, I took a picture of their bulletin board. So have the dot on your driver's license, become a donor, give life. Okay, so just like in school, I always have too much material, so I'm gonna quickly go through my second half here about court, how, court house facility, courtroom facility dogs. Because how do we help children? How do we make them more comfortable to testify? Testifying is horrible. I don't know if any of you have ever been in court. You know, and we also say to, you have? We also say to prospective jurors, how would you like to come to a courtroom and tell a whole room full of strangers about the last time you had sex? Would you want to do that? And actually, here's one thing we'll do. Um, juror number one, would you please turn to juror number two and tell her the last time you had sex? And then juror number one's looking at me with the deer in the headlights. I go, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I could just, well, the last time I had, no. So you tell them, you would be mortified if you had to come and do that. Okay, now you're eight years old. You're 10 years old, you're 12 years old, you're six years old. Imagine how traumatic that is. So what has started, what is really great, is I got to be a pioneer in JJ and Skyler's case. We were the first ever San Bernardino County case to use a courthouse facility dog during our trial. That was to give comfort and aid to the two child victims. And in the years since this has started, um, it started in 2003, I'm really happy to report that I did a little research before my talk today, and more and more states now have passed legislation along with the federal government allowing dogs to be used to comfort and facilitate the testimony of not only child victims, but vulnerable victims in court. So let me explain to you a little genesis of that and how we do it. Okay, was the dog. So as I said, it's stressful to go to court. Let's go look over here. And the presence of an appropriately bred and trained dog can significantly reduce the anxiety of these experiences. Petting an animal produces short-term decreases in blood pressure and or heart rate. And here is one of our dogs. San Bernardino County has two. They're Labradors, and they're named Dozer and Lupe. And our dog was the female Lupe. I can't tell the difference between Dozer and Lupe, no one really. One's a boy and one's a girl. So these good effects can be seen even if a person is simply in the presence of a dog. So, do you think the defense likes having the dogs? No, they object their face off. So here's some of their common objections. The dog will distract the jury. The child will be distracted. The child will take the oath less seriously. The dog will detract from courtroom decorum. Jurors that like dogs will like the witness more than the defendant. The dog makes the jury feel sympathy for the witness. If the dog physically responds to a witness exhibiting stress, the jury can't tell if it's stress from lying or from recounting a traumatic experience. I can't cross-examine a dog. <laughs> okay, well, we have answers to these. The dog is less prejudicial than some other witness accommodations. The neutral presence of a facility dog is better than the use of a comfort item or support person. They're less noticeable than if little Janie is clutching her teddy bear, or her dolly, or her mommy is sitting two feet from her. They are more neutral and less prejudicial. Um, the support person. So the support person for the dog, uh, what we do in our county, and I believe most counties do, is the handler doubles as the victim advocate but they are trained to have no facial expressions, no reactions to the child's testimony, and they're not giving signals to the dog or to the child. The dog's presence reduces stress and allows the child to tell what happened. So more truth, we, we get the truth 
because the child will relax. And the court can instruct the jury not to draw any assumptions or conclusions. So there's an evidence code section here that says the court shall exercise reasonable control over questioning of a witness and shall take special care for a witness under the age of 14. So that is the code section that we use to allow dogs in the courtroom. There are court cases that have supported the use of dogs. So I listed a few of those. We don't have to go through all of those. There's one where a developmentally disabled fellow used a dog for his testimony. Various statutes. All right, I'm going to skip this just in the interest of time. This is about a dog. And keep going here. There's Stilson. This is the pleadings that I did in the case of JJ and Skyler to allow the dog to, testi to testify, to be in court, legal pleading. And our dogs even have their own Facebook page. Now what we did in our case to minimize any appearance of impropriety or prejudicial effect, the jury was told there was a dog. Why? Because Lupe snores. <laughs> so we didn't want her to think, or the jury to think it was the judge. So they were told that Lupe snores and they might hear that, but they never saw her. What would happen is the handler would come from the back of the courtroom while the jury was still outside in the corridor, place her under the witness stand, and then she was already in place under the witness stand, and the child would come and sit in the chair, and then he would be given her leash, because that's control, and then be able to pet the dog during the testimony, and the dog would be out of the sight of the jury, never made a sound, and then when the testimony was finished, the jury would be excused, and then the dog would be taken out. And we had a little witness waiting room attached to the courtroom, and after the jury was taken out, then the dog would be taken out and brought into the waiting room so she could comfort all of us, <laughs> including me, while we were waiting in recesses. So the dog was never physically seen by the jury, only that they did know just in case they heard the strange snoring, which I never did hear. Okay, this is a little story about them. There's our two dogs. And this is Dozer, which is the other dog with a student trainer. This is one of, the, one of the children with the dogs. Okay, this was our handler during our case. And these are our boys. And there was an article about the boys. They'd grown up some since the report. And there's them with Loopy. And then we participated, those are the boys, JJ and Skylar, we participated in a PBS documentary, short PBS documentary that I just have time for that talks about the use of the dog. So we'll skip this one and we'll go to this one. Where's my guy, Dan? And we'll just about use our time up. That's not the one. Wrong one. Page before that. That's the one, PBS. Dogs Thanks. have long been used in classrooms for children with special needs, as visitors in senior citizens' homes, and as comfort for patients in hospitals. Can you guys hear? Now, canine companions are being used to help crime victims cope with the aftermath of violence and abuse. Special correspondent Kathleen McCleary has our story. Hey, you're here too? Wow, okay, come here, buddy. How are you? I hear you've been busy in court, huh? In San Bernardino, California, two black Labradors are regulars in the district attorney's office. Three-year-old Dozer and two-and-a-half-year-old Lupe are among DA Michael Ramos's newest staff members, part of a special victims canine unit. Last August, they were officially sworn in, paws on a California criminal law book. The dog's job is to reduce fear and help some of the most vulnerable victims, many of them children, feel comfortable in court. They've never been in a courtroom, you know, in their lives. And add on top of that, they're going to have to discuss and tell a jury about how they were either physically abused, uh, sexually abused, 
um, and have to relive those horrible moments in their lives. Dozer was detailed to a case in juvenile court late last year. My daughters were um, a victim of abuse. Yeah. Pearl Curiel's daughters had to testify. Yeah. I felt nervous because the judge is like right there and um, you just look up at the judge and you think I'm gonna freak out. I feel kind of scared, but once I saw Dozer with me, I wasn't scared anymore. I couldn't be right there where the mom is supposed to be. I couldn't hold my daughter and rub her back while she talked, you know? But he was. He was able to say, you know what? I'm not gonna leave you, and I'm gonna sit right next to you, and you could pet me, and you could talk to me, you, don't, you know? I don't know if, if they would have made it through without him. It's so silly, because it's like, it's just a dog, you know? It's just, but he is a superhero. Like, for my girls, I know he is. Dozer's handler, child advocate Jessica Scioli, believes the dog's support will have a long-term effect. Whenever a victim gives their testimony, they feel empowered. So I think the girls getting up there and telling their story and telling what happened is the first step in them being able to um, overcome the situation and become survivors. The other lab, Lupe, was tasked with calming two young boys, one allegedly abused by a relative. In April, the dog accompanied them on a mock run-through, ahead of the actual trial. I had a, uh, um, a rape case for a child that was raped from the time he was four to ten, and um, was all alone, couldn't tell anybody. Uh, it was very difficult for him to have to uh, describe what he went through. The young victim was really nervous, really stressed, and Lupe, our dog, picked up on it and went up to him and nudged, nudged the young victim on the leg. The young victim started to pet the dog, rubbing his ears and Lupa's, you know, on him. And he was able to relax, didn't have the anxiety, and he was able to tell what happened to him. The dogs have their own office. Like humans here, they work a nine-hour day and then go home with their handlers. It cost about $80,000 to start up the facility dog program in San Bernardino. Park. That includes a specially equipped van with windows that roll down if the temperature inside gets too hot, and water bowls that won't tip over. Officials expect the dogs to remain on the job for about nine years. Judges have to approve before a dog can come to court. The jury's told in advance that the dog will be sitting here in the witness box, sight unseen, and defense attorneys have the chance to object. Do you ever hear that the dog might be able to create some sort of sympathy for the victim? Is, is that a concern? You know, that was a concern. In fact, there's been briefs written and, and motions written by attorneys, by district attorney's offices when that issue comes up. Once everybody gets comfortable with this whole new process, I don't think you're going to have that issue. Um, because even the defense bar, all they want is the truth as well, and so do the courts. Last year, Dozer and Lupe were deployed to the scene of the terrorist attacks in San Bernardino, along with two English Labrador retrievers. Wally and Giovanni had recently joined the FBI as the Bureau's first crisis response canines. They comforted victims and families and helped relieve stress when employees returned to work a month later. Assistance Dogs of the West in Santa Fe, New Mexico, breeds and trains the dogs. They've placed 15 in judicial districts and have at least eight more in the pipeline. They also provide dogs to individuals and organizations, but courthouse work is growing, says Executive Director Linda Milanese. We realized that this was an area that was really exploring something new that had the potential to reach a lot of people and that was really making a new map in the world, in the world, in the judicial system. Most courthouse dogs are labs and golden retrievers, bred for good health and an even temperament. Intensive training starts early with lots of hands-on attention. Get it? Professionals work with them one-on-one, -on -one, often in public places. Nice. The dogs learn about 90 complex tasks. Children ages 8 to 18 teach them commands too. Honey pie, come. 
High school sophomore Natalie Longmire Coolis has been training dogs since she was nine. The dog learns patience. They also learn how to be touched in different ways because obviously nine-year-old hands are different from 18-year-old hands and so they pet different ways and they cuddle different ways and their bodies are different. So it really just allows the dogs to get used to different body types and different ways of handling. Having the dogs being trained by students, one of the outcomes is they all learn to listen to little voices. Jill Felice founded Assistance Dogs of the West. All of you guys can do, get your leash. She says the key to instilling calm and trust is simple science. Dogs actually help us release oxytocin, which is the calming hormone and the bonding hormone. And when you are able to have that hormone going through your body as opposed to the stress hormone cortisol, it's much easier to tell your story. After nearly two years of study, the dogs move on. Distinguished graduates. Love story actress and animal lover Ali McGraw presided over this year's we commencement ceremony, celebrating 12 four-legged graduates. Among them were the FBI dogs, Wally and Giovanni, who flew in from Washington for the festivities and a labradoodle named Zeus, who's headed to Veterans Court in Albuquerque to work with vets with combat injuries. McGraw believes the courthouse dog program uses compassion to promote justice. I'm so moved, especially in this crazy, often negative-sounding world that we fear-driven that we're in now, when I see that a few people can change the lives for the good of everybody involved and I think it gives me hope. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Kathleen McCleary in Santa Fe, New Mexico. All right, we can cut it now. I don't have, the only, only thing I have left is, let's see, we're skipping this one, and the end. <laughs> hey, I'm only two minutes past my time. All right. So do we turn on the lights, or how do we do this? Ask the prosecutor okay, thank you. anything. All right, we have time for a few questions. First question from the audience. I was wondering how you dealt with what you called sensitive material. It felt overwhelming to hear about that. I was imagining you know, spending years with those kinds of cases. How did you manage yourself? That's a really good question, and it was hard. And like I mentioned, the first time I was in Crimes Against Children, I had no children, and so it wasn't as personal. Of course, I had you know, nephews and things like that, but they weren't my own children. Once I had my own baby, I decided it was a little too close, and I went into other work, and then my children grew up, and they were no longer in those vulnerable years, and I rejoined the unit. And even though, of course, as a human being, it's very hard to deal with, I didn't personalize it. Um, later, as I started having a grandchild, it started to get more personal. And quite frankly, as I entered my 60s and I was still a trial attorney, it was getting harder and harder because that is the war room. That's the war, that's the battleground. And it was much harder trying these types of cases as a 60 and 61 year old than it was as a 28 year old, 29 year old. And so I got out and I went into the uh, treatment courts and I worked in non-child abuse courts for the last part of my career. Is videotaped testimony of children acceptable instead of having them to uh, testify in front of uh, witnesses? Very good question. Yeah. And you would think that that would be far more humane. The problem is the constitutional right to confrontation, where we all have the right to confront our accusers. And so only in very small, limited cases, it has to be a child under the age of 10. 
There has to be a showing that the child would be psychologically irreparably damaged by having to testify in court. Uh, so a psychiatrist has to testify. And then the videotaping has to be done where the defense has the opportunity to ask questions and the defendant is not physically in the room but gets to view it. It has been done in a handful of cases in my courthouse or in my county. I personally never did it. I just wanted to thank you so much for coming today. Where are you? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I was not going to come here this morning because 30 years ago, as a teacher in Los Angeles, I was a mandated reporter of all the abuses of the students that we would observe. I was integrating children who were seriously emotionally disturbed with typical kids. First of all, the parents and grandparents didn't want them there, and um, we wanted to use dogs. First of all, if we did report the cases, the kids would show up back at school or in another school because there wasn't probable evidence to get convictions. So we thank you. I thank you for that. I thank you for sharing everything, but especially in the end about the dogs, because my idea was that if we, in integrating these children who were seriously emotionally disturbed with their typical peers to learn appropriate behaviors, if we use dogs, the dogs would attract the typical kids and make our difficultly challenged behavioral kids calmer. And there were no examples, but I found one in San Diego at a high school. So um, the superintendent in LA allowed us to take teachers down to observe. And it was so powerful to see in this classroom how the dog worked in calming the child and attracting the typical kids to the, like you saw, the disabled child there. So I want to thank you for that. And I hope that with your work that we'll find more and more schools that will allow the dogs, because you already have made such a breakthrough with this, and I had no idea about it. So thank you, and dogs I'm so glad amazing. I came. Thank you. <laughs> Over here. I have a question about jurors. It's my understanding we are entitled to a jury by our peers, but if so many people have been victimized, and then they are eliminated from the jury pool because they have suffered an event out of their own control. Doesn't that diminish the jurors who might be inclined to be more like the victim? Um, I, I just feel like to be excluded from the jury pool because of something that was beyond your control when it happened has the potential to be abused by the prosecuted by the uh, defense. The right to a jury of your peers is the defendant's right. It's not the right of the victim. So when you're talking about a jury of the peers, it's people from the community that don't have biases. So the problem or the perception is that someone who has experienced it themselves would be biased or unable to process the information in a fair manner against the defendant. It doesn't automatically mean because somebody has been victimized that they're off the jury. I don't know if I gave that impression. Um, they, if they say it happened to me but I can be fair, they're not excused, but trust me, the defense is gonna kick them off. But that reminds me what you said about the jury of the peers. When I first started my career, I had an assault case, and both sides were kind of dicey people. And the jury foreman came to me afterwards. He goes, hey, if you have a right to a jury of your peers, how come there wasn't 12 dirt bags on the jury? <laughs> yes, I have a um, question. I, I want, first, I want to commend you for the great work you've done. Um, and I personally believe, assuming the person's been uh, tried properly and legally, they should hang them from the highest oak tree in front of the courthouse. But my question is, my question is, they've, they've changed in the state of California the, um, the statute of limitations. If you were abused, you have so many years to do right. it. Well, the problem is, and once again, I'm not advocating, and, and I think they should crucify these people that do these bad kinds of things, but 
at the same token, they are entitled to a fair trial. If I did a crime and I know it's past the limitations, I'm going to throw away all the documentation that I kept so that I could defend myself. Well, how is that fair? Well, there's uh, so many rules about proving cases that are old, beyond the statute of limitations, where these statutes have been extended, that there's like a notebook this thick about when can you prosecute, and, and it's, it's very complicated. But basically, to answer your question, before you can file a case that is aged, like we're talking 20 years, 30 years, you have to have independent corroborating evidence. So it wouldn't just be the word of the victim against somebody that touched her 30 years ago, you'd have to have some sort of independent corroborating evidence, which is often very difficult to obtain. So that is supposed to guard against where something could come out of the woodwork. Or in your question, I mean, your question was more like, I got rid of all the <laughs> corroborating evidence. Um, and that was the whole point of statute of limitations, that you don't have to look over your shoulder forever. But you've got, you got to be able to prove it, and there's also been uh, due process um, decisions where it is a violation of due process that you could be prosecuted a million years ago when that ruled. So without boring you with all the legalese, there was a limit of when we could start. We, we could only start like 1993 and beyond. Because even though supposedly the statute was moved way back, ex post facto, which is a legal term, says you can't be prosecuted after the fact. So once the law was passed, that was the starting point. So you're really not going to be able to prosecute in criminal court things that happened in the 70s and 80s, although apparently in the civil world you can sue, but that's a whole different world than my world. All right, I we hope have, that answers that. And we have time for one more question. Right over, right over there. Do you feel that your prior experience as a reporter yeah, who's asking me this. helped you become a better prosecutor? Oh, great question, and absolutely yes. That, that I found my training as a reporter where I had to go to strange people and get them to talk to me and call up anybody and get the story and take notes and listen. That It just was a seamless um, transition. And believe it or not, people were more afraid of me as a reporter than they were as a DA. <laughs> because Mr. Big would talk to me, because Mr. Big didn't want to be in the newspaper as, you know, Mr. Big refused to make a comment. So I thought that was interesting that a lowly reporter, you know, paid nothing. You know, I could call Mr. Big and get an answer. But yes, the two careers worked very well together. Actually, we have time for another question right here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Um, I was wondering if you can prosecute incest victims, victims of incest. Okay. Yes, um, colleagues of mine have. Uh, I'm trying to think if I ever, well, I did have a case in the end of my career. It was her half-brother. And so incest was one of the charges, but the main charges were child molestation because he was much older. But yes, it comes, comes about ever so often. Yes, it's a crime in California. Okay. All right, everybody. Are we going to do the and reveal? Karen. Are we going to do the reveal? <laughs> huh? I want to thank, thank Karen, who's also my sister. It's my sister. I've known her all my life. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. So I'll see you next week when we have another career prosecutor, Debbie Plowhouse, who is not my sister. Coming. But she's my friend. <laughs> she is your friend. And this will be a talk about the rights of protecting the rights of animals. And she's way week. more interesting than me. <laughs>